begin. <laughs> that might be a cue for me. I'm yeah. not entirely <laughs> sure, but I'm going to take it on. <laughs> um, so uh, welcome everybody to to home broadcast live from Fun Sox home. Um, really, really glad that these are still happening, even if it is in a new weird form for everybody. Um, because we are on Zoom, um, if I can ask everyone to, to mute yourselves, uh, it just helps for the audio quality. Um, and, um, and, and we are recording these classes as well to have available um, after class. Um, today, if you saw the email, uh, we're going to be uh, developing compassion for, for what may seem to not deserve compassion. Um, you know, this is a interesting spot humanity has found itself with the, with the coronavirus raging and the difficulties in the world. Um, but a student asked this question of Punsak recently, how do we show compassion even to a virus? Um, and, and, and I'm curious myself, <laughs> um, but I know that there are, there are two options and, um, and only one gets, gets me where I wanna go. So um, we'll have a meditation from Punsak, and then that'll be followed by some commentary from him. And time permitting, afterwards, we will have a little bit of Q and A. Um, so if you can save your questions for then, that would be great. Um, and I think without any further ado, I will turn this back over to Punsak to lead us on a meditation. Thank you. So we're, we're going to do a meditation for community, sensing the sense, keeping the sense of community. We did this meditation before. Uh, we're going to do it again now, more in a more brief way. <clears throat> it's a meditation that I remembered from uh, my days in uh, when I was putting together the New Age movement. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, a little story about that. Uh, there was a couple of friends of mine that we, we all actually became, uh, uh, we all became ordained in succession. Uh, but we, before we became ordained, we were into this, uh, this other kind of groups, spirituality, and there was a meditation that we used to do to sort of, even though we, we were in separate places, travel in different places, there was this meditation that we would, we would do where we would, uh, at a certain time, uh, no matter where we were, we would link up, we would say, uh, but in, in thought, sort of continue to have a sense of that we are in, in the same space. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is because strangely enough that uh, after doing this meditation for quite some time, uh, the sense of feeling, sensing each other uh, is always felt. It always feels like we are always in each other's presence. Uh, like if we see each other uh, after maybe, even after some years go by, we see each other, there's a sense that there was never a break in the continuity of our being together. Uh, because of that, and 
and because of uh, what's going on. So we definitely do have a, a community here and because we don't physically see each other directly, there might be a sense of disconnection. So we want to reconnect to that sense of being connected. So we don't end up, you could say, falling for the appearance of being disconnected. Remember, there was no disconnection. It's not a reality. Connection is the reality. Okay. And every once in a while, we sort of have to remind each other that we created this appearance of separation. We created this appearance of disconnection, but it's only an appearance. It's not the reality, which is constant, never changing. We are always connected. Okay. So that's why every once in a while also when there are these things that promise us, uh, we are going to connect you. But it's not really that they're going to create something called connection. It's not that connection doesn't exist and now they're gonna make it happen, but rather remind us that we are already connected. That's what this matrix is gonna be about, okay? And we won't spend too much time in it because it's very short, actually. Very short means that it's less than an hour. <laughs> okay, so get ready. So make the intention to enter into that space that we call meditation, an inner sacred space. Where we will encounter the closer and closer the fundamental reality of our being, the fundamental basis of our being. And as we approach that, closer and closer. That's what is referred to as getting deeper and deeper into meditation. As we approach it, we will experience certain signs that we are approaching. From the very beginning of even making this intention to enter, we may begin to experience the signs. This space in a relative way can be expressed as utter peace utter joy, utter clarity, utter radiance, utter unity of mind or concentration. So as we approach it, we get taste of these, like a, a pleasantness, a calmness, clear sensations arising pointing to the clarity, pointing to the radiance, helping to draw the mind, to unify the mind, to unify consciousness, attention. So make that intention. Check your posture, make sure it's conducive, that the posture is comfortable, that it is stable, Spine is upright, not uptight. Head and neck centered. Mouth, teeth, tongue resting in the natural places. Arms and shoulders are even, relaxed. Eyes resting softly. Even now, perhaps you may already are beginning to touch the meditative state. As you feel confident in your posture, in the body's cooperation, in the body's 
conducive experience. Make the commitment to fully enter and knowing that what you're approaching is your own is your own fundamental nature, is your own sacred sacredness. So hold that frame of mind, that sense of respect, that sense of trust, that sense of gratitude. And imagine that you're going to, not even imagine, but have the sense that you're going to drop as closely as you can. You're gonna take a dive and allow ourselves to fall so we can get as closely as we can. Feel ready in the body. Feel ready in the mind. And together, a nice deep breath in through the nose. And through the mouth, just let go. <sighs> and as you let go in the body, let go in the mind, let go in the breath, let go, let go, let go, let go. As you breathe out, let go, let go. Feel that letting go. Feel the momentum in that letting go. Keep letting go, keep letting go. Let the breath take you where it's taking you. Leave the breath alone and just stay in that momentum of letting go, letting go, letting go. Letting go. Letting go. Letting go. Stay in that momentum. And as you stay in that momentum, feel that momentum physically in a palpable way in the body itself, that the body itself is in that momentum of letting go. And as you let go, notice the signs arising, notice the signs enhancing. And as you notice them arising and enhancing, rejoice, rejoice, welcome the calm in the body, in the breath, in the mind. Welcome the pleasantness in the body, in the breath, and the mind. Stay in that momentum. And while abiding in this momentum, take a little inventory of where you've reached, where you are in the body. Gently bring the light of awareness, scanning the body, noticing the signs. And as you notice the signs, rejoice in the, in the legs, in the torso and arms. in the head and neck. In the eyes. As the inner sensations begin to arise, rejoice, that's clarity, that's radiance that's approaching them. And we will stabilize with threefold breath, breathing in through the nose and out the mouth. And each time you breathe out the mouth, really have the sense of letting go and feel it in the body as you let go. Allowing awareness to go deeper, to go closer, deeper into that space of calm and peace. We're going to stabilize with threefold breath in through the nose, 
out the mouth. And really let go. Trust in the ground to hold the body for you, let it go. At the end of it, let the breath come back naturally and another full breath in through the nose. And again, out. <sighs> Let the breath come back by itself. And when it returns, and another full in breath. And release. And dive, 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 dive. Noticing the signs enhancing rejoice. Let yourself know that indeed, because of the presence of the signs, you are in the meditative state and you are getting deeper and deeper. You're accessing ever more subtle, ever more powerful levels of consciousness, rejoice. These subtle, ever subtle levels of consciousness are powerful because with them we can bring about immediate transformations. joyfully witnessing the signs that you're indeed in a meditative state. Now have a sense of what you might call your future awakened self, your potential for awakening. It could be just an idea, a possibility, such a thing could be doesn't that necessarily have to be a direct communication with any whatever. Just let that go through your mind. And think of it as sort of existing in its pure potential form, in its pure uh, form of fully embodying those potentials in the space in front of you at the level of your eyebrows. And by bringing attention to that space in front of you, you begin to feel a sensation in the forehead. Different people, remember, have different sensations. So whatever it is for you, when you bring your attention to that space, acknowledge it. And feel the bright presence of that future awakened self, the potential that you have already within you. eventually because of just thinking of this being. You remember there are moments where that's the only being, that's, that's all that existed. You sitting, meditating didn't exist. There was only this potential 
So at those moments, try to capture those moments, try to stay in that moment. Even if you lose it and it's just a memory, go into the memory of it. And from that being in front of you, see rays of light, a beam of light connecting your heart to its heart, your throat to its throat, your forehead to its forehead. And this gives you a sense of connection a sense of continuity, a sense of being able to let go of whatever illusions you have about who you are, whatever fixed ideas you may have. You have a sense of the potential that is within you, that a sense of we're not bound to only disappearance. There is this potential within you. And slowly this being approaches you. And the closer this presence gets to you, the more it starts to forget about the you that is confused, the more you forget about the you that is limited. You're not even concerned if it is, if it is not. Just thinking about, just looking at this potential. And eventually, through the rays of light, acting like a magnet, you're connected, you become one entity. And whoever the limited being you, you were identifying with, that's no longer there. Now it's just this potential radiating, glowing exactly where you are sitting. And see all around you, all of us gathered from different places, just have a sense of them. It doesn't have to be accurate. It could be completely imaginary. Just that part of you that senses each other. Thinking of perhaps it's just a word of each other. So that's enough. And whoever you, whoever comes to mind, Wherever's presence you feel, immediately send rays of light from your heart, connecting with their heart, rays of light coming from your throat, connecting with their throats, rays of light coming from your forehead, connecting with their foreheads. And eventually more and more comes in, more and more comes in, and we form a circle our hearts touching through this rays of light, our speech, communication, expression connected through this rays of light. 
our appearance connected through rays of light. And this massive light begins to form in the very midst of our, of our circle. It's almost as if the very embodiment of what you might call this very group, like the one, the noun that becomes the noun that points to all of us as a group. Us gathered here, thinking of it as a something and in the very center, it is beginning to take form as this incredibly bright presence. And it's like a mirror reflecting the potential of each one of us. Not just the potential a million years from now, 10 years from now, but in this incredible way, the potential of every moment. And from it, this collective us, rays of light coming from its heart. Do you see the color? Do you feel it? From its throat to our throats, from its forehead to our foreheads. And just stay like that for a moment, feeling that.
we get ready to come out of the meditation, still sensing the sense of being in some measure in the meditative state, noticing the degrees, the qualities of the calm, the pleasantness and the other signs. As you notice them, you choice. And ask our capacity to understand, to come forward. that, make the intention to come out of the meditation, but to stay, keep that sense of being connected. The same way we entered, we arise from the meditation, taking a deep breath in through the nose and breathing out the mouth. Feel it, hear it. Through the nose, breathe in. Through the mouth, breathe out. And as you breathe out, let go, let your mind now go into your immediate surroundings, making contact with your sense of touch, noticing the temperature again, noticing the feel of the clothing on you again, noticing the cushion, the seat, and slowly let your ears hear the different sounds, let your eyes take in light. All right. All right, very nice to be here again. Nice to see some of you. I can't see every single one of you, but well, I sense you. <laughs> okay. Uh, this topic is a topic that I've been hearing about for quite some time, and it's interesting that I remembered my uh, good old days in the uh, new age, <laughs> forming new age, creating new age. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and there's a beautiful thing, uh, beautiful talk given by uh, Alexander Berzin on the, on the different takes of, uh, of this idea, because we have different ideas of the dark side. Uh, there's the uh, Star Wars interpretation of dark side. And do we really understand what, it, what they mean when they, in the Star Wars when they're referring to the dark side? It's as if we, the audience watching the movie uh, or who's reading the books uh, fully understand what and they say, oh yeah, the guy fell to the dark side. Yeah, oh yeah, the dark side, yeah. Uh, to, uh, as if we all have the same idea of what they're supposed to be. And that's the dark side that uh, now as far as the movies are concerned, uh, we're supposed to be the, the, the forces of light or supposed to be fighting and then constant war and constant battle with. Uh, and there's in the in what we might call the realm of psychology, there's a different, quite different take of what they refer to as dark side. Yeah. And sometimes these things get confused, they get uh, mixed up. Like when someone says dark side, someone is thinking Star Wars dark side, and the other person is re uh, referring to as psychological understanding of what they mean by dark side. Uh, the dark side that we encounter in Star Wars is somewhat uh, very similar to the dark side idea that we hear about in a lot of different religions and in, in different uh, religious and spiritual uh, 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 organizations and uh, institutions. But uh, in 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 Buddhism, what 
the term dark side can be referred to uh, is sort of like a, it can be taken as those two things together, but, but it depends on the, the, the approach. It depends on the context of how to understand it. There is the dark side, which is basically our ignorance, but not ignorance in a sense of, I don't know what's happening over there because I, I didn't see over there, but rather the ignorance that uh, even though I don't see what's over there, I know what's over there, that kind of ignorance, the, basically an active ignorance where we uh, draw a conclusion and we are attached to our conclusions without any direct experience of it. That's what I mean by, it's not, that, it's not like intuitively you know what's over there even though you, know, you, you don't see what's over there. I'm talking about you have no direct experience of what's over there, but you have this conviction, I know what's over there. Okay, and we are living by that conviction. That's, that's ignorance. And what is re mainly referring to is merely we are ignorant about our nature but there is the conviction, I know what my nature is. And that's what we act upon. That's what we, uh, makes us, that's what determines how we relate with, with ourselves. And that's what makes us, determines how we relate with others. This conviction, I know what my, my nature is. And it's not something that we necessarily consciously think about. It's not something that we, you know, wake up one day and we think about, oh, what's my nature? Okay, my nature is this. And then you try to act from that for, uh, for the rest of the day. But rather, it's an unconscious drive, an unconscious conviction about who we are, which is not based on any direct, any direct perception, any direct uh, uh, understanding, okay? So this idea of this, uh, this, ignorance, this ignorance and everything that sort of supports it uh, the views that we have, the actions that we take in order to support this idea of this ignorance, that can be referred to as the dark side. And of course, the proper, re the proper uh, response on how to, how to relate with this dark side is basically bring in light. That's how you respond to it. And it is not referred to as um, something that actually exists. So the ignorance as a actual, or let me say, let me put, put it this way. There is the understanding, which is the, uh, which is the ignorance. And then there's the thing that ignorance is, is proposing. Okay. And the thing that ignorance is proposing is proposing that this thing exists, okay? What I believe is out there, that really is out there, even though I have no direct experience of it, even though I have no idea if it is or not, okay? But there, it, uh, it is being presented in the sense that it is really out there, right? So in terms of our nature, ignorance is saying, this is who I am. And then there's a conviction that this I, this, this, uh, I, this nature that I'm saying I am, it actually exists. It actually is, it's, it's real. And that's what we act out of. That's what we, uh, that's how we relate with ourselves and that's how we relate with, with society, with others, okay? So when I say it doesn't exist, I'm referring to what ignorance is pointing to. What ignorance is pointing to is not something that exists. It is a lie. As a matter of fact, uh, just a little bit of uh, digression backwards, so to speak, to the last topic that we talked about, about trauma. So imagine uh, consciously, uh, not consciously, but living, a, a, a living an existential lie on a moment by moment uh, state of being. That itself, you can call, you can say is traumatic. And that's the big trauma that I was referring to as the existential trauma. Because at every moment that we believe this false uh, history, this false narration that we are calling ourselves, 
And when in fact, it is just a fabrication, it is a lie, it is not what we really are. So, and acting as though it is, it, it, it's real is a, is a traumatic way of existing. So one way of referring to samsara, that term samsara, you can call it, you can say it is existing traumatically, continuing a, a stream of existence, a stream of being where in every moment you're existing in trauma. And what's the trauma? This is not who I am, but I'm acting as if this is what I am, this is who I am, no matter, uh, in, in, an abs in, an absolute in an absolute way, okay? Uh, so going back to where we, where we are now. Uh, so this idea, what, is, what could be the, the thing that our ignorance is pointing to, that is, the the identity that we are supposed to be that ignorance keeps talking about ignorance keeps uh, trying to keep alive it doesn't exist and yet we act as though it exists right so the ignorance itself the ignorance itself exists in, in a relative sense, but the object of the ignorance doesn't exist. And that's what makes it ignorance. It is believing something that doesn't exist to, be, to exist. It believes that I am this, whoever it is that, you, that we are fixed on thinking that we are, that makes us afraid, that makes us, uh, makes us feel unconnected, that makes us experience all different kinds of, 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 of pains, of, of, come, of, of suffering. It is because of whole, trying to hold on to something that doesn't exist. Okay. And, and the natural uh, experience that we have with the things that we are relating with, because we are relating with them from a place of ignorance. So you're, as if you're looking at fire and you think it's flower, you're looking at a flower and you're thinking it's fire and you're convinced that's what it is. And when you touch it, it's not behaving the way it's supposed to be, the, the way it's supposed to be behaving. So this is creating, uh, this is creating suffering, okay? So this ignorance that is, uh, for, for example, the fact that there is a being here. Okay, this is going to sound quite uh, uh, <laughs> quite out there, so bear with me. Okay, so this being who is suffering, and is suffering because of this ignorance about uh, that it, uh, that it actually exists. its nature, the lie that the, the suffering that it is experiencing is the lie. The suffering that it is experienced is the lie about it. Because in removing ignorance and we look at ourselves for what we really are without any, without any imagination of what we're supposed to be but looking at ourselves for what we really are. And as I'm saying this, try not to, try not to imagine it, okay? That's ignorance feeding itself. Don't, even, don't try to imagine it. Oh, what could that be? The we, the me, the, 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 the real me. Don't, 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 don't try to imagine it, okay? Just let the words sink in, okay? Let that part of you that instinctively knows that, the, and it is because of that part of within us that is that instinctively knows and then it is sort of being fed a lie against what it knows that it's creating the trauma, right? So let that, let that part just listen, okay? Uh, so 
the real, our real nature cannot suffer. Our real nature is free of suffering. And don't try to imagine what that is, okay? Don't try to imagine what that is to not suffer. What to not suffer? Well, don't try it, okay? Just let it sink in. Our real nature doesn't suffer. Okay, just stop there. Okay. And yet, the lie is that we are suffering. And the only we that can suffer is a fake self. And for as, for as long as we perpetuate this fake self and don't try to let, don't try, don't let your imagination and think, oh, fake self, okay, there must be, this is the real self. Okay, remember, don't, do, don't, don't, don't let your imagination come in, okay? Just listen to it with your, with your instinct. Uh, and it's, it's a, uh, actually a wonderful way when you when you're meditating on 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 true nature of reality, some of you know that uh, emptiness is try not to let imagination come in. Okay, and uh, at times will you may notice uh, flashes of insight. You may not be able to hold it for too long, but you will even notice a flash flashes of ah, oh, uh, and but you may have lost it. And the reason that you have that, oh, is because we try to grasp onto it. And you, it's not something that you can grasp, okay? Something that you just have to allow, okay? So this kind of dark side, the ignorance, and we see it in, uh, in a very terrifying uh, poster that you see in a lot of uh, uh, Tibetan temples at, at the, it's, it is it is posted close to the close to the entrance of temples and 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 uh, and monasteries. It is this poster of supposed to be the world uh, uh, in the mouth of the of a monster. The monster is supposed to be ignorance, and the monster is supposed to be the thing that, when you overcome it, you're a conqueror. You're the one who destroyed the foe, and the foe that you destroyed was ignorance. Okay. Now keep that in mind. So this is one aspect of the dark side and our response to it is to fight it. Now, does that mean we should not have compassion? Should we have compassion towards that if we're calling that the dark side? And and it is, it is this, should we have compassion for ignorance? Should we have compassion for fundamental ignorance? Okay, should we have compassion for the object, for that which ignorance is presenting to us? And the answer for the second one, and, and, I, and we, we're gonna go back to the first one a little bit later. The answer to the second one, that which is ignorance is presenting to us doesn't exist in the first place. So what, uh, how, what, how are you going to have compassion for it? It doesn't exist. Okay. Now, remember, it uh, existing and not existing is not referring to your experiences, whether your experiences exist or they don't exist. If you're having an experience, it exists. The nature of its existence is that it is relative. And that's the only kind of existence that there is, a relative existence. Uh, ignorance tries to make perhaps a relative experience into an absolute experience. Not trying to make it an absolute in the sense that we want to make it last but absolutely in the sense that uh, its nature is relative, its nature is momentary, its nature is always changing, and, it, and, and ignorance tries to make that into something that 
is forever, that is unchanging. Okay, that's what, that's what ignorance is trying to say. So the thing that is unchanging doesn't exist. But ignorance says there is such a thing and it believes such a thing exists. Such a thing, such a person doesn't exist. So the object, that which ignorance is pointing to, since it doesn't exist, and compassion exists, compassion exists and the compassion should be extended towards that which exists. Compassion can only be extended towards that, towards that which exists, okay? For it to be effective. You can extend compassion towards, towards space, empty, called, uh, should say towards empty space. Not for the things that are in the empty space itself, but for the empty space itself. Uh, this compassion that exists that you're extending toward empty space, will it have an effect on you? Will, will, will it have, will it touch something? Okay. So, uh, so the object of that which, compa that which ignorance is pointing to and ignorance itself. Now, should we have compassion for ignorance? And the answer is, <laughs> should we have compassion for ignorance? Before we answer that, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what is this compassion that we're supposed to extend to ignorance in the first place? What is compassion about anyway? What is compassion? Just like you have the dark side and we have to sort of understand, okay, what does it mean by the dark side? Okay. So that was one aspect, one understanding of what dark side is supposed to be. There are other aspects of dark side and we're gonna go back to that. We're gonna go back to that. But just for a little bit, let's, let's understand compassion. Okay. Uh, the way compassion is presented Compassion is presented in a way that is very simple. It is a concern you have, a concern, a feeling of concern that arises within you when you are perceiving what you see as suffering. Okay. When you see suffering, when you see pain. And what is compassion is, is a, a compelling feeling asking us to do something about it. It can stay as just a feeling and it, or it can continue, it can mature into an actual action. Okay, it has all these different levels of, all different levels. Yeah. There's just a feeling and you, sometimes we have it, you see someone, you see something, you feel this, uh, this feeling of connection a feeling of reminder of your own, uh, your own state of fragility, your own suffering, your own pain, and then it, and being brought into that state and you feel, you, uh, you feel almost as if you feel for, for what the other person is feeling. And there was a, perhaps a desire to do something about it. And it can continue where it goes from just the feeling where you actually do something about it. Uh, that's, that's, that's compassion. So compassion is a feeling that we get invoked, in, uh, induced when we perceive what we per understand as suffering. And, it, and, and, and that makes compassion relative in that sense. Where someone can be looking at over there and see suffering and someone else looks in the same direction, doesn't see suffering, okay? Now, don't ask the question, which one is seeing it cor uh, uh, more correctly than the other? Don't ask that question, okay? The thing is, you yourself, you see something and you recognize it, acknowledge it as suffering. As soon as you acknowledge that suffering, you will respond. Your, the natural response will be compassion. That's why when our compassion doesn't go to the, uh, doesn't get processed, 
where it doesn't go to the to the place where we sort of like uh, you could say bring it to a a, a, a a sense of what you call that term completion. Uh, yeah, completion. Then it's sort of like you remain in the in the in the state of can I should I can I should I should I can I we just stay in that we we don't really take ourselves out, out of it. Uh, that, and that state itself could be very uncomfortable. And because of this, the discomfort associated with that part of when the processing of compassion, we may want to not experience this, the, the discomfort. And in wanting not to experience the discomfort, we prefer not to see suffering anymore. So this doesn't arise within us. Okay. So the person who's looking over there doesn't see suffering. It could be someone who has, you could say, has pushed down their perception or their, their input of this as being suffering and not process it and to, to recognize it as suffering. So, they don't, so compassion doesn't come into them. Or it could be someone who for them, those signs are not signs that point to suffering, that anything that they can uh, say that's suffering. And because of that, compassion doesn't arise within them. Okay. Now, so these are different relative ways of perceiving something and then for us to, for, for, for it to be perceived as compassion, uh, as suffering or not. And then for compassion to arise. The mind is quite automatic, okay? Uh, in a sense of uh, the way it responds to things. It's almost, uh, uh, and it's because it is automatic, you could say it has, it follows a certain law. Just like the physical body follows a certain law, does the mind follows a certain law. And the law that I'm referring to here is when you keep going back to something, when the mind keeps going back to something, keep revisiting it. Uh, eventually, it becomes uh, uh, it becomes a mode for the mind to relate. It becomes a way, a means for the mind to relate in the future. And that becomes itself automatic. And, and this is what I'm referring to. If every time we are looking at suffering and we get stuck in the, uncomf this, the discomfort of, of should I, should I, should I, what can I do? I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And I, want, I need to want to do something. And then this discomfort, if, we get, if, if the discomfort is what we keep remembering, what we keep bringing to the mind, when we experience, when we are perceiving suffering, then we are basically telling the mind, stop seeing suffering. And eventually the mind will either blind us from suffering, from seeing, from perceiving suffering. And that's a very dangerous thing, especially for uh, spiritual people, you know, especially <laughs> for spiritual people, people who are on that path, because uh, there is, along with your compassion, there's, this, uh, or, or you could say, very powerful instinct. I have to do something. Something has to be done. And we, may, and what we are able to do at at that at that moment may not be sufficient to satisfy us. It may not be powerful enough to satisfy us. And because we're not satisfying ourselves on how we are responding to compassion. Uh, we might make ourselves become thinking that, well, since I'm not able to help anyway, might as well not see this thing. Or we might even uh, uh, draw up com uh, philosophical conclusions that are all made up. Uh, the, reason, the, the reason that I am uh, suffering is because I'm seeing suffering. The, the, the very act of seeing suffering is itself suffering itself. Or so, so for me to to evolve as a spiritual being. When I evolve as a spiritual being, I will see less, I will see less suffering. 
and eventually I will look everywhere, I will not see suffering. Because they are somehow connecting the experience of suffering that they have the discomfort of not being able to respond to suffering as itself being uh, the perceiving of suffering, okay? So there's perceiving suffering, there's the discomfort that comes, comes, comes with that, and there's the wanting to respond, and then we get caught up in responding to the suffering that we saw and the responding to the suffering that we are experiencing as we are processing what we are perceiving. And a lot of us get caught up no longer in what we are perceiving, but rather in what we are feeling. Okay, and, and, and that's where uh, we get lost a lot, where we are no longer concerned about the person who is suffering, but our response that we are experiencing to perceiving their suffering. And one way that we may respond to that is, um, uh, sadly, uh, we may respond with anger. Or we may respond with uh, thinking that we're taking care of it, but in actuality, we're not taking care of it. We are taking care of the pain that we are, the discomfort that we are experiencing. It's like you're looking, looking at something that is not pleasing to your eyes and the discomfort of having to see it, you want to cover it up so that the discomfort, will, 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 you will no longer experience the discomfort. Okay. So we have to be very careful about when we are experiencing, when we are experiencing compassion, that there, are, there might be two experiences of, of discomfort, of pain that, that, is, that is taking place are on to it and it itself. And remember that the reason that it came up is to respond, not just to yours, but to, to that one, to the one that you're perceiving. So we have, I digress a little bit. I'm not even sure if I'm gonna get to the dark side stuff. <laughs> uh, but this is a very important thing. And I think by understanding these that will help us to move on to be able to extend compassion because if you understand that and that doesn't mean that the discomfort that we are experiencing we should ignore it we should neglect it we shouldn't do anything about it okay we, sh we should in, in turn have compassion for it okay it is it is an actual discomfort that we are it is an actual suffering that we are perceiving okay but we understand that there are two of them at that, at that time, okay? And we have to address, depending on which one needs um, more, needs your attention, attention the most, okay? Like, I see the suffering and I'm a, I cannot function properly because of the discomfort that I'm experiencing, okay? So now you're dysfunctional and you better not go try to help, okay? Because it will only make things worse. The thing to do is to probably in the beginning understand that you're just processing something. And the reason that it feels so strongly for you is because you are actually more evolved. You're more sensitive than the regular, uh, regular people, okay? You're in the process of developing, a, you're in the process of re-establishing your sense of connection, okay? And because of that, and you're, you're becoming more sensitive. You might even be more aware of the pain that the person is going through than your own, than, uh, than they are, okay? And because of that, uh, because of your highly uh, high sensitivity and because you're just going through a process, you have to un uh, so first have compassion for yourself. Direct, the, du direct this wish to direct this concern towards yourself, especially when it's overwhelming. And, and, and don't uh, have the instinct of, 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 of saying or thinking, oh, I don't want this, let me not experience this anymore. Don't have that instinct. And this is the danger I was referring to. 
because of this high sensitivity that you're developing and because of not feeling powerful enough to do something ab about what you're perceiving, this instinct of, I don't, want to, I don't want to have to go through this again, in a sense of, I don't want to see this anymore. And eventually, if it's strong enough, you will be able to cut it off. Cut off that, it, that capacity for that connection. And when you cut off that capacity for connection, and as a spiritual person, connection is very important. Sensitivity to connection is very important. And you will find yourself later, and you, you will not know exactly when, that you're looking at things and some instinct is telling you, you should be feeling this way. Why aren't you feeling this way? Okay, and then some other kind of uh, trauma will happen, another kind of uh, a dysfunction may happen, okay? And this may be more painful than the, the feeling itself when you are perceiving suffering, okay? So to avoid that altogether, don't wish it away, understand it is a process, understand it is because you're evolved, you're sensitive, that's why you feel it as strongly as you do. And if you cannot find it within yourself to do something, it's the time for you to ask yourself, that, that within me, which is responding to this, which is wanting to do something about it, okay, come out and do something about it. I'm making space for you to come do something about it and be open to, to that within you, okay? And you'd be surprised uh, what you will find yourself able to do when you do that, okay? All right, uh, let me make sure I'm not running too much out of time, okay? All right, so, uh, so, that, so there is this ex existential kind of, what I might call, I love that word existential. Maybe I should stop using it. <laughs> Uh, the dark side, right, which is ignorance, uh, and and now compassion. Uh, and compassion is the natural outcome. Seeing suffering. Now, what is compassion trying to do? What is the wisdom underneath compassion that makes compassion? Be, that makes compassion, compassion, okay? It is at the deepest level, a recognition that just like trauma, this should not be, suffering should not be. There's a fundamental understanding of our deepest nature as being blissful and yet, in the freedom, which is also our nature, we can create incredible, beautiful illusions of suffering. And there will be, and then when I say illusions of suffering, I'm talking about in reference to our true nature, in reference to our true nature, which is blissful, even though our true nature is blissful, yet we can, in our being, experience something not blissful suffering. And since the suffering is not our, in our inherent nature, that's why, we, that's why it's an illusion. Okay. Now calling it an illusion doesn't mean that it's, it's, it has no reality whatsoever. Okay. The freedom that is our true nature, the, that freedom, which is that we are connected to, it allows for an experience of being where that being is experiencing itself as suffering and it can identify itself as suffering. It's like a, uh oh, this is not Elon Musk kind of thing, okay? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a virtual, it's a virtual reality where in the realm of the virtual reality itself, the blue is blue, the red is red. It's a virtual blue, it's a virtual red. It's not, a, it's not the red, it's not some ultimate red, it is just the virtual red. So in, the, in this uh, 
uh, in the realm of possibilities that we can create, suffering is one of them. So it's, uh, you could say it's a kind of a virtual, virtual uh, suffering, but in the virtual world, it is, it is suffering. It, is, it has all the, the marks of suffering. And when, so when, when you're experiencing compassion, when you're looking at, when you're seeing suffering, in a sense, it is your innate wisdom that is recognizing, wait a minute, this shouldn't be. And that's why you feel compelled to do something. What you feel compelled to do is to, hey, wait a minute, wake up. Suffering is, is not real. Suffering is not your nature. Okay. Suffering is not, is not the underlying nature here. And that's what you're feeling compelled to do. So compassion is, in a sense, wisdom in action. Okay. It's wisdom in action. So wisdom sees without moving and compassion acts. It's wisdom acting. Okay. I don't know what this means. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that. So wisdom, compassion. <laughs> This is not some sacred mudra, okay? Don't, don't. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so we have this sort of like uh, understanding of the, the nature of the compassion that we are talking about. So what is compassion? It is innate wisdom responding to what it feels, <laughs> what it sees as, wait a minute, this, this, is, this, is, not, this is not real. This is not the true nature. This is virtual. But, uh, but not only, uh, like, there should be a sense of, like, you're, you're watching a movie. It's a scary movie or it's a whatever movie. There should be a sense of, oh, look at that movie. It's nice. Oh, you should be enjoying yourself. But imagine someone caught up in the movie and thinking everything in the movie is real. So compassion is, is that wisdom that understand the movie is not real. And then responding to the person who believes the movie is, is real. So trying to wake up the person, well, it's not real, it's not real, okay? So think of it like, that way. That's what compassion is. So when you feel compassion, it's your inner wisdom responding to your perception, okay? To what you're perceiving, all right? Uh, now, uh, I'm gonna tell a little story. Uh, and then from that story, uh, maybe you can sort of answer the question yourself. And I'm gonna go a little bit, tiny little bit into the other kind of dark side, psychological dark side, okay. Uh, there's this, uh, in the email that I sent, the, that very frightening looking uh, person is supposed to be Vajrapani, okay. Vajrapani is supposed to be uh, power, the embodiment of enlightened power, all right. Uh, uh, so, once upon a time, in a time that we cannot point to, <laughs> uh, Vajrapan, uh, there was this celestial being who was, who spent millions of years identified and witnessing uh, itself being venerated, itself being idolized. Okay, so it grew up, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it attached to the ide identity of I'm, I am by nature uh, uh, venerable, venerable, venerator, venerable. <laughs> God, what did I just say? I am by nature venerable. I am by nature, it's like, it's like uh, since the moment existence came into being, if there was such a thing, I've been, I've been venerable. And up to now, I'm venerable. I am uh, ideal, uh, I'm to be idealized. That's, that's, that's what I am. I am I'm that which is to be idolized. I'm that which is to be uh, venerated and respected and bowed to and all that kind of stuff because that's what I'm seeing. That's what, uh, that's what my reality is telling me. Okay, I'm buying it. I'm seeing it and therefore I'm buying it. Okay. And uh, supposedly one day uh, Vajrapani uh, came into the presence of this being and this being who believes this identity is that which is to be venerated by whoever comes into his presence is waiting for Vajrapani to, uh, to bow to him or waiting for Vajrapani to show him veneration. And Vajrapani is not showing him any of those things. So for the first time in millions of years, this being is confused because 
I am that which is when someone comes to my presence to be venerated and, and all that kind of stuff. And here I am, my perception is deceiving me because I'm seeing someone and the person is not acknowledging my nature. <laughs> it's, not, it's not following the, the, the lines where I'm supposed to be, okay? And so having compassion <laughs> according, to its, according to his own understanding of what reality is supposed to be, uh, having compassion for Vajrapani, say, um, uh, Vajrapani, it would be good for you to uh, bow to me. <laughs> and, uh, and Vajrapani res responds in return, actually, out of compassion for you, you should bow to me. And then, uh, what? But that's, that's not who I am, that's not my identity. I'm, I'm, I'm not the one who bowed down to other people, I'm the one who received bows. I cannot, uh, sorry. So this person, uh, this being was, uh, it's the, this person, this celestial being's ego was like, you know, at the highest that it could be. Cannot see itself bowing to anyone else. And a second time, Rajapani said, um, you should bow down to me for your own good, you better bow down to me. And of course the person didn't, uh, didn't do it. And the third time Vajrapani said, okay, this is the last time I'm gonna ask you this and I'm warning you, uh, it's, it's for your own good, you have to bow down to me. And of course the celestial being did not listen. Now Vajrapani is enlightened power. Within every enlightened, within, within every enlightened quality, all the other qualities are present. It's just that one is being emphasized, okay? And interestingly enough, what makes it power, it is compassion. Remember, love allows. Oh, you wanna have fun? Oh, go ahead, have fun. You wanna play with fire? Go play with fire. If, if you're convinced it will make you happy, you know, you should be happy. Go be happy, okay? That's love. I mean, that's a, a way of, a, a nice way, poetic way of saying it. I don't know if it's even poetic. <laughs> but it's a very, a very simple way of presenting it. And compassion says, no, you are not going to suffer. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna stop you from suffering. That is not your nature and I'm not gonna let you not be your nature, okay? That's compassion, okay? Compassion is concerned about suffering and removing it, removing the lie of, of, of suffering. So this celestial being, you could say, was suffering because of its humongous ego. Was suffering in the sense that it was disconnected from reality, disconnected from understanding reality. And that is a su big suffering that he was going through, even though he may not know it. And Vajrapani, out of compassion for this celestial being, this is what his compassion did to help him become free of his fixed ego. Vajrapani, it is said, uh, this is a uh, now, uh, what do you call that? Rated, uh, violent, violent <laughs> rated. <laughs> this is rated violence. <laughs> Vajrapani tore off his skin of the celestial, store the skin of the celestial being, put it back on him backwards threw him on the floor and stepped on his, step on his back. Okay. Now was that anger or was that compassion? Mm. <laughs> the concern of Vajrapani was the con concern for the suffering that the being was inflicting upon itself. Clinging onto this uh, clinging onto this false idea of, a, of, a, of its ego and making it calcified, making it, uh, uh, calcifying it, making it crystallize stronger and stronger, okay? So because he spent, this being spent so much, so many millions of years calcifying, crystallizing this, this, uh, this, this false idea that it needed a drastic, uh, intervention 
to break to break free of it. That's why Rajapani put his skin backwards on him and then threw him on the ground. The thing that he thought was not his nature at all made him experience it being stepped on by someone else, by another being. And all this time, Rajapani was doing it out of compassion, out of concern for the suffering of his celestial being. And when, the, when, when this uh, situation was over and other celestial beings came to ask this celestial being, ah, oh, what was it like? You know what, is, what he said? I've never experienced bliss like this. I've never experienced bliss like this. <laughs> so Vajrapani wasn't doing it to punish him, but rather to connect him to his true nature, which is bliss. Okay. Now, with that little story, let's try to answer the question. I was, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not running away from the answer, okay? <laughs> question. I'm not trying not to answer it. Uh, okay. Now, if you understand the story, the context of the Vajrapani story, understand what compassion, what compassion is compelled to do. Now, maybe you already know the answer. Should you have compassion for ignorance? Yes. Yes, you should. And a compassion for someone or for something is not like uh, tolerating their bad behavior, mm -hmm. allowing their bad behavior to continue. That's not what compassion is doing. Actually, that's the opposite of compassion. Okay? That is complete opposite of compassion. If you see something and it's a suffering and, you, and, you, and you're pushing your compassion down, I don't want to feel it, I don't want to feel it. That's the opposite of compassion for anyone, for yourself and for the one that you're seeing. Okay? If you see someone suffering, and no emotion comes out of you. You're disconnected. You are, you're, not, you're not evolved at all. There's no subtlety to you. There's no, there's no sense of uh, sensitivity to you whatsoever, okay? But if you are able to see and feel what's going on, you're evolved. In compassion, some sense of wanting to do something about it is coming, coming within you you are allowing yourself to be, to be your true nature and you want to do something about it, okay? So when we respond out of compassion, we are allowing ourselves to get more connected to our true nature and we are reminding ourselves of this fundamental innate nature and the response to be not to punish but rather to help in the ways that we can, in whatever capacity that we can, that we have amassed, that we are brought together to help the other also connect to true nature, to their true nature, because that true nature is blissful. When that celestial being was forcibly uh, forced to look at his true nature, it wasn't, it wasn't punishment, it was bliss. It was connected to bliss so that they could free themselves. Okay. Now, uh, before uh, time runs out, uh, so I talked a little bit about that, and I wanted to talk about, uh, I guess, what you really want to understand, want to, want to hear about. And, and I think that's the thing that confused me, and that's the thing that confused some people, because uh, when, uh, for me, when I heard Dark Side, I was sort of uh, raised to understand the dark side as, okay, that's the thing you fight. That's the thing you, you struggle against, okay? But there's this, this other psychological understanding of dark side. And it is uh, dark side in a sense as the part of ourselves that because we are ashamed of them for whatever reason, that we put them in the dark. That is, we put them in the darkness of, of our, the light. We, we, we starve them from the light of of our awareness of, of their presence. 
and the reason that we stop them of the light of uh, of the light of our uh, of awareness of our presence of of our awareness is because ignorantly we think by putting them there somehow they will disappear somehow they will go away but these are issues that we have to understand parts of us are crying for, uh, no, let me put it in a different way. It's not like they're crying for attention. I'm very, there is a crying for attention, but rather uh, there, are, there are aspects of our beings that we have to attend to, aspects of our being that we need, that needs our, uh, uh, that needs to be attended to and we put them uh, uh, away. And because we put them away, they, are, uh, they do not share in the nourishment of the light of our awareness. And they creep, when they are creeping up, because they're creeping up from out of darkness, that is out of unawareness. So in the beginning, they might be scary to look at because it seemed like, seemed like uh, non-existence, annihilation is approaching us. And of course, because we believe that's what it is, we, are, we, we, we turn away from it. And because it creates a kind of fear when they are approaching us, when we, that is when, uh, when, when we have slight awareness of them, uh, we because we fear that they are, because of the fear, because we think that they are, they are there to annihilate us. Of course, we, the, we, we, we think that the natural reaction towards what you think is annihilating you is hate. So we direct hate towards them. And when we are directing the feeling of hate towards them, we're actually wishing them to stop, to, to cease to exist. Uh, the thing is, remember, compassion towards that which is not existent is, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's useless. It's useless waste of, it's waste of energy. Okay. But compassion is directed towards whatever exists. Whatever exists is part of the feel of, of, uh, of, of connectivity. So those parts of us that exist, because they exist, we should shine the light of compassion towards them. And what does that mean? Remember, it's not tolerating, it's not letting them continue to be what they are, but wanting them to be connected to their true nature. The underlying nature of everything that exists is bliss. If it exists, its underlying nature is bliss, no matter what appearance it has, okay? Compassion towards our dark side means the parts of us that we ourselves uh, are ashamed of, we ourselves are afraid of because uh, we see them and we are afraid of them. And we keep them in the darkness of our, of our, of our mind. When they do come up, the way to address them is to understand that it is a part of us because of big ignorance We've collected them because of big ignorance. We've collected them. And uh, you could say there are responses to suffering. There are different responses to suffering. Buying into, I'm a being who suffers, who can suffer, buying into that, then we create this universe of aspects of our being that, uh, uh, that emerges from this, from, from this various, from these different uh, ways of suffering, from these different sufferings ex uh, experiences, okay? And responses to these various sufferings, okay? Uh, and, and I don't want to make it sound too abstract. Uh, 
like, okay, let's say a dark side of you is anger, right? And you've heard it before, they stay away from anger. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a annihilator, especially in your spiritual path, right? And as you're trying to be spiritual and you're trying to be uh, a good spiritual person and you, 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 you put, you, you take anger, you put it in the, in the closet, put it in the, in, in the dark closet and you don't want to see it anymore. And then whatever anger is coming out, whatever anger was trying to tell you in the first place about your response, a part of you that is suffering, And you just see anger as uh, this thing, this dark side, this part of you that you're ashamed of, you just push it back. So you never get to hear what anger has been trying to tell you all, all along, okay? So, to un so how do you approach it with compassion? Is to understand that, ah, this thing, this entity, this anger is connected to some kind of suffering. and you invite it in that space of understanding it is connected to some set, set of suffering. And, and anger, remember anger is not necessarily the, uh, what is connected to suffering, but it's the messenger, right? And you're feeling angry. So don't throw the energy of hate toward anger for, for being there, but rather be with it with concern for the pain, the pain, the pain and the suffering and wanting to do something about it. And as you just don't act, don't, don't do anything, but if you're caught up in the yelling, if you're caught up in, the, in, in that and you, you can't seem to stop yourself for whatever reason, uh, you don't wanna come out of it feeling uh, regret and you know, I'm talking about dysfunctional kind of regret, dysfunctional kind of guilt. You don't want to come out of that. But if you're caught up in that, you find yourself incapable of, of not controlling your speech, incapable of not controlling your action. And that's an extreme, right? So immediately have a sense of detachment and look and have the eyes of a mother looking at a child. Become your mother, become your father. Look at yourself in such pain, and you want to do. You and you want to do. You want to uh, do something. You, you so much want to do something about that pain, and you don't know what to do. So that's what you're doing. You're ang You're showing anger. So if you remember, anger is 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 the, the essential message of anger is I am in danger. I wanna protect myself. That's the essential message of, of, of anger, okay? So if you understand that, when you are angry, when, uh, when you're in the midst of it, don't be the one who's angry, but rather look at yourself angry and make space for yourself who is angry and understand that its concerns are real. If its concerns weren't real, it would not be, it would not, it would not be, it would not be there. Its concerns are real. Approach it, listen to it, listen to its concerns. Part of you may consider those concerns to be, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. What, what, uh, no, this, it's, it's not for you to judge whether it's relevant or irrelevant, whether it should be or should not be. But the thing is, it is, it is a legitimate concern for, for, for that part of you. And speaking psychologically, not that I'm a psychologist, but it could be a five year, the five year old within you who, who had an experience, felt powerless, felt in danger, in some form or whatever, whatever the danger may have been, my, my uh, sense of connection is about to be shattered, my sense of wealth is about to be shattered, my sense of, or all the way to my, my, uh, my existence 
is, is about to be shattered. So whatever the concern was, it was a legitimate concern. And the anger at, the, at, at you and your five years, five year old may not have been processed. You didn't do anything about it. And because you didn't do anything about it, it doesn't just go away. It keeps resurfacing. Whenever it notices any signs similar to the signs that it experienced back then, then it comes up, okay? And it could be uh, you're just having a, a conversation about something and, so, and a word is said and then anger comes up because you're hearing in that word the same way you, you heard it when you were five years old or whatever, okay? Uh, then the thing to do is to, you must have compassion for that dark side, for, for this, the, which you're calling the dark side, the part of us that we are ashamed of, the part of us that we want to hide, that we don't want others to see. Notice that the, yeah, the dark sheep of the family kind of thing, dark sheep of the personality complex. Uh, so understand it's a legitimate concern, have a sit with it, that is feel it and be aware of what it, what is it that it wants. And, and that's all it wants most of the time is to be heard. Just like that five-year-old maybe wanted to be heard and wasn't heard, okay. And, and anger is, is one example. It could be uh, your, your shame of de having desire. Yeah, have a sit with it. What is, what is it that desire wants? What is it that it wants to fulfill? What is, it, what is this legitimate claim? Okay, and have a sit with it. And then watch it grow as you sit with it. It's a child and because you sit with it, because you consider what it is considering to be legitimate concern and you will see it actually grow, evolve. Okay, and perhaps what it, was, what it kept concern, being concerned about is something that is irrelevant presently. But for now, it's, it doesn't see it as uh, as being irrelevant, but you can shape it by listening to it, by listening to that part of you, okay? And eventually you will, in your, in, in your presence, you will see it grow and it will not go away and, be, and, and, and become something else, but it will evolve. It will continue to want to protect you. It will continue to remind you that your nature is bliss, that's what you should be going towards, okay? But this time you will not get stuck to something that ignorance brought to it. Uh, so as far as ignorance is concerned, so I guess we sort of covered the three main poisons here. As far as uh, ignorance is concerned, the way you direct compassion towards ignorance is to understand in a sense, ignorance wants to understand. Okay? It wants to understand. Okay, it, run, it jumps <laughs> too fast to draw conclusions about the, what it's supposed to understand, but in essence, it wants to understand. If you can understand that and you can have compassion for it, okay, you want to understand, okay, yes, you're, it's legitimate that you want to understand and now let's, let's, uh, let's, let's get there. You want to connect with your blissful nature. Okay, it's, it's legitimate, let's get there. You want to be protected, it's legitimate, let's get there. Okay. Uh, now, uh, okay, we're, we're gonna end soon <laughs> and we're gonna do that meditation. The, there's another dark side, and I think uh, it's the, this is the dark side that really confuses uh, a lot of people when you hear compassion for the dark side. But it's more the dark side in terms of action, okay? Like, oh, let's throw something in there, like uh, something very obvious, killing. Is that a dark side that we should have compassion for?
someone wants to kill, someone wants to uh, do something to harm another. Should we have compassion for that as a, our dark side? If I don't know if, 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 that, if, if that was be pointed to as our dark side, that, that the part of us that engages in action that harms others, that's also considered the dark side. I mean, not, not harm others in a sense of like your runaway anger, uh, end up harming others, even, even though you did not intend to, but having the intention to harm others, that kind of dark side. Should we have compassion for that? And how do we have compassion for it if we should? Like, uh, and, and is, this, is this kind of, uh, is this question that has other questions connected to it in a sense of, and we could think of, a, you know, uh, someone who's famous for having harmed so many, many people. Should we have compassion for that person? Well, consider anyone who's caught up in, uh, in a crystallized sense of ego, the same way that Vajrapani considered that celestial, whether, that's, whether the person considers himself to be, I'm worthy of being worshiped and look at those people worshiping me, or I should destroy everyone. So that's a, that's a crystallized idea of who I am or what I should do. That's someone who's disconnected from reality of connection. And we should have compassion for such people. And does it mean compassion for them means, oh, go ahead, go kill those people. Oh, go ahead, go cause harm. That's not what compassion for them means. As a matter of fact, that's the opposite of compassion. That is not having compassion for them. Because in, the, in continuing their activities, not only are they harming others, which is, which is bad, but they are severing their ability to be, to have that sense of the reality of that sense of connection, which naturally brings out compassion. And sorry, I didn't even think I was gonna talk for so long. And you know, <laughs> oh my God, I've talked. I didn't know that I could talk so long. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, let me, quickly throw the, open the floor for people who want to ask questions. Perhaps uh, I didn't quite address something that you wanted to address, especially with this dark side and compassion for. I guess uh, Emmett is uh, controlling. No one has any questions? You don't have to have a question. Don't, don't feel uh, intimidated. <laughs> You may have explained everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there's if there is a question or or maybe two, um, you can unmute yourself and ask now. Hey, Punzak, I have a question. Hey, Hazam, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I guess my question is what the impact of having compassion is on the person who is having compassion, because a, a lot of the talk was about having compassion for other, even though I guess some of those parts are within ourself. Because mm -hmm. I guess what came up was even when you were saying having compassion for something that doesn't exist, doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And it made me just wonder, like if it does still, if that feeling like of the sense of me being compassionate, mm -hmm is a positive sense, even if it doesn't necessarily equate to some benefit in the real world or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, yeah, uh, sorry. I, uh, did, I, did I cut you off? Were you, were you finished? Well, I guess the second part was, mm -hmm. and is there a, um, a danger of becoming addicted to, to trying to be compassionate too? Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Creates a positive uh, feeling inside of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the first point that you, the first thing that you raise about uh, just having compassion and radiating it without necessarily 
being triggered by, oh, I'm directing compassion towards that person, I'm directing compassion to that person. Eventually, you want to arrive at a point where you're just radiating compassion. And this sense of radiating compassion, you're not just radiating it out to space for the sake of space itself, but rather for whoever, whatever, it can reach that kind of radiating. Uh, radiating it, when, I met, when I say radiating into space, it's not like uh, if someone were to come into that space, you would sort of like take the compassion away from them. All right, you want it to be just for space, just for nothing itself, for no one. It, that is, there's no c condition or situation that you're having a compassion for. That's what I mean by having compassion for, for space, for, for empty space. But you do want to get to a point where your compassion is radiating, that is ever present, ever ready to embrace, whether there's someone there to embrace or not, but it's ever ready, ever present, to, ready to embrace. That's the, that's the ideal compassion. Okay. Now, uh, just like with everything, it's not, it's not a matter of doing it too much or doing it too little, but rather not doing it wisely enough, right? There's a danger, there's always a danger. Uh, uh, the thing is we have to understand that there is a, there's a history, there's a trauma of, of, I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep using that word trauma for a while, so it's your fault. <laughs> Uh, uh, of, of, of uh, existing with a misinformation. And that misinformation doesn't just go away. It's not that a misinformation, it's spread out, okay? Because it is spread out. We may have removed it from this area and from that area, but there are other areas that, that we removed the misinformation about, like, you know, many different things. Uh, that's, uh, uh, Never mind. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, because there's always this misinformation at some level present, you have to make sure that when we are responding, when we are in uh, inducing compassion, and that's why uh, having compassion for nothing, okay, that could be uh, addictive, where there is some. Uh, Absorption in anything as a meditation is a very pleasant experience. If you can experience an absorption into the feeling of compassion, uh, you might, uh, I'm gonna throw a word in there, uh, which I don't like to hear, reify. <laughs> you might reify the f good feeling that you're having. And that reifying is uh, something that ignorance does. So ignorance sneaks in into your beautiful experience, makes itself, a, makes itself a host. So I understand what this is and this is what it means in a sense. And now we are having a different experience about the compassion. So our attention is not really directed towards compassion, the aim of compassion, but rather it's now directed towards this good feeling. And that's a danger. The good feeling, we shouldn't push it away. I mean, some people you hear about this or you're starting to have bliss, oh, there's bliss, it's a danger, uh, uh, push it away. No, understand it to be a part of the process. It's not the aim, okay? And uh, uh, something that, uh, an experience that the Dalai Lama uh, said uh, in an interview, I think I mentioned this a few times, but I'll say it very quickly about when you have compassion, uh, it is uh, a salve, it is a healing for the world, for, for everyone, for the world and for yourself. And especially for the one who is, who is allowing themselves to feel compassion. What, what you're doing, and if you allow yourself to go deeper and deeper into compassion, you're really allowing yourself to go deeper and deeper into knowing your, your, your true self, knowing your true nature, knowing your, knowing your fundamental nature. So that's what, what happens. That's what compassion is doing. And as you're doing this, since your one fundamental nature is bliss, so you're getting closer and closer to that. But you're getting closer and closer. You're not there yet. On the way there, if you allow 
ignorance to come in and then attaches itself to the nice feeling, then the nice feeling become, becomes the aim. And now you're no longer on that, on, on that journey that compassion was taking you anymore. It's like uh, uh, a practical explanation is like someone uh, is concerned about uh, someone does an act of generosity and then they feel good about it, which is good that they feel good about it. It means that being generous or being those do things is not, it's not uh, unhealthy for you. It's actually healthy for you. It's a sign that it's healthy for you, for the one who's doing it. But when they become, uh, they, when they continue to do it just for the pleasant feeling that they felt before, it is no longer about the concern about what generosity is concerned about anymore. And it might be, uh, I'm, I'm gonna twist this around in the dark side of, uh, put it in the dark side of, 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 uh, of Star Wars, where uh, ew, it might be, might be too dark. Are you ready for this? This is very dark. <laughs> You have a medicine that can help a lot of people. And you can make profit from it. So it's not about what the medicine can do anymore, but it's more about the profit that you can get from it. Okay. And you're focusing on the profit. And because you're focusing on the profit, you may end up doing the very opposite of what the medicine intended to do in the first place. Okay. And this can be taken into on the spiritual path where you're on the trajectory of where compassion is taking you, but you get attached to the byproducts of compassion and you get stuck with them, then don't blame compassion for not having taken you to your, in, to your enlightenment because you are, no, you are no longer with compassion. Now you're just with the nice byproducts, okay? And uh, the dark side of it was the, that's the other kind of dark side. <laughs> and what should compassion do to somebody who's caught in that kind of dark side? with compassion, with concern for their blissful experience, do what Vajrapani did. <laughs> if you do nothing and you're able to do it, you have no compassion. <laughs> okay, sorry, I hope I, that addressed you somewhat. Hey, Josh. Hey, how are you? Well, hey, how are you? Cool. <laughs> uh, so can you have compassion for things that are like not alive? Like, can you have compassion for the coronavirus? And can you have compassion for an act? Not the person committing the act, but the act, like murder. Uh, no, you cannot have compassion for the act itself. Okay. Uh, can you have compassion for corona for for uh, the coronavirus? Yes. Is it because? But but, the, but it doesn't mean that. Oh, coronavirus! You just want to kill people. Go ahead, kill people. I'm have compassion for you. That's not that's not compassion for coronavirus. But you know, it, on a, it, there are many levels of this. You can even say you could address it. A hey, coronavirus is trying to help strengthen our immune system so we can be more connected. You could also say that about coronavirus. Uh, as far as the act of murder itself, that the person committing the act have compassion, the act itself. Uh, I mean, to say to have compassion for the act, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's like uh, having compassion for space or something, for empty space. 
is the person committing the act that you should have compassion for. Okay. I hope that uh, addressed it. Thank you. Okay. All right, sorry. Uh, we're running out of time. I'm not, we're not running out of time. <laughs> we ran out of time. Uh, yeah, I wanted to do a, medita a very brief meditation. Was, it has to be a brief meditation on uh, uh, a dedication. Uh, say it's a meditation on dedication. Uh, f uh, coronavirus. Uh, may have uh, this situation, whatever it is, I don't know, okay? I'm not gonna claim to know anything. Whether it's some big conspiracy, whether it's, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, epidemic not taking care of, the way it's supposed to be taken care of, or whatever it may be. Okay, the thing is, people are suffering, okay? Whatever it is, people are suffering. And, and there are people who have died, okay? Uh, I know someone who lost someone, and you may know someone who knows someone who lost someone, or maybe someone very close to you, okay? And you may know someone right now who's probably fighting it, fighting something, okay? Whatever is going on, and I'm not gonna take any side and say this is what it is because I don't know. But I'm, what I know, what I'm perceiving is that there is suffering. So we're going to do a meditation to dedicate, dedicate the meditation to those who have passed away because of that, who have lost, and, and especially those who are grieving the loss. And those who know someone or who is uh, fighting in some form or another. In my insignificant experience of... Uh, feeling your lungs uh, drowning. Imagine uh, that multiplied as a very difficult way to, very difficult thing to experience. Okay, so go back to your posture and remember as clearly as you can, the state that you were in when you were in meditation. Try to remember it so vividly that the very vivid memory of it, it's beginning to give you the experience again. And as you begin to reconnect with that experience, Let's take a deep breath to re-fully enter, a nice deep breath into the nose. And as you breathe out, just let yourself release into that experience. <sighs> let go, let go, and start to feel the signs enhancing in the body, in the breath, in the mind. Stay in that, stay in that, stay in that. And in this meditation, we will answer all questions about where should we direct compassion. So again, have a sense of the community. Wherever, whoever may be, feel their presence. Don't get fooled by the, the appearance of distance. Separation is never real. Connection is the reality. is a true reality. And see ourselves connected with this light, whatever color comes to mind, through the heart, through the throat, through the forehead. And the composite us, the one that you can say, oh, the home people, the home group, so that sort of entity. The composite us and our ideal Okay, relax, relax. And have the intention 
to connect to the power of compassion, to connect to its concerns and to become an instrument of that power, to become an instrument of that concern and power. Have that and let that line intention be communicated through the line, through the line of through the light connecting you to the sensual, connecting to all of us. And because of this wanting, community wanting, it becomes very powerful. And we cause the, our aspiration causes the central being to be even brighter, clearer, and the dazzling, more and more dazzling to behold, more and more attractive to look at, to be with, to be in the presence of, that's us. And from the point between its eyebrows shoots immeasurable rays of light going in every direction. And those rays of light touches other groups like this, composite beings like this, all over the planet, all over the universe. And because of that, because of this network of connection that we made, we are recognizing, we are sensing effortlessly the power of wisdom. And let it come to your mind, those who have passed away, and just hold in your mind the wish, the thought. May they be free of suffering. May they be free of the causes of suffering. And let this become a strong, passionate wish within you. May they be free of suffering. May they be free of the causes of suffering. May they be free of suffering. We don't necessarily have to say the word, but feel the intention of the words. And See waves of light, almost thick like water, radiating from that center, enveloping us. No longer the distinction of separate cells is discernible. There's just one orb of light, carrying with it that wish and that power, not only to have the intention, the wish, but the power to do so. And see everyone bathe in this light. And now, Take up the ones 
that you remember who have passed away, those who are grieving, hold them in this embrace. Those who are fighting, hold them in this embrace. In this, make your personal dedication. And then now let's come out of the meditation. You can keep that sense of awareness of connection through the nose, a nice deep breath. Through the mouth, breathe out. And deliberately reconnect with your immediate surroundings through your sense of touch, your sense of hearing, and your sense of sight. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you for teaching Pung Sak La. Ah, thank you. <laughs> please stay. Please keep teaching. And thank you, Pung Sak. I saw there was a note that got sent in the chat um, asking if there was a recording of this available. It will be on Pung Sak's Patreon page tomorrow morning. It's at patreon.com slash Dubten Pung Sak. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, feel free to come off mute and say uh, good night. We'll end the meeting in just a moment. Thank you, Punsak. I'm uh, so, so super grateful. Angela from all the way upstate. Oh, nice. Hi. Thank you. Hi. I was actually thinking about you and I was going to reach out and say, could you do a teaching? And then the email came through and I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So you created it. <laughs> I agree. I created it. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. I definitely have to re-listen to it again. It was Dense. a lot to take in. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you. Okay. And and it's good to see everybody. I hope everybody's well. Sending everyone lots of love. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.